Hi, I'm Mark Hobey, Producing Artistic Director at Paper Mill Playhouse. All of us here at Paper Mill hope that you and your loved ones are safe and healthy during this time. While our theater is physically closed right now, we wanted to find a way to bring a theatrical experience right to you, to bring theater into your lives, into your homes. And so we've dug into our vaults and found these humanities symposiums from the past. We'll be streaming them live each Thursday night at 7 p.m. Just tune in to our Paper Mill Facebook page and have a theatrical experience right from your couch. Hope to see you here each week. The life of the Brontes is so fascinating. Uh, it's even more interesting than the novels they wrote. And we have quite a, an interesting group of people here to help us bring to life the story of the Brontes. We have two guest speakers. Our first guest is the curator of the literary and historical manuscripts at the Pierpont Morgan Library in New York City. And he, just last season, curated an exhibit called The Art of the Brontes, Drawings and Manuscripts. He also holds degrees from the University of Texas and the University of Michigan. Please welcome Robert Parks. Our next speaker is the, currently the chairman of the English department at Rutgers University. And uh, he is also the uh, secretary and treasurer of the Dickens Society of America. And he spoke here for us when we were doing our Dickens Symposium. And you may all remember him when he was here. Uh, he's published several works on Victorian literature and on the Bible. Please welcome Barry V. Qualls. Now we have four cast members with us tonight from Jane Eyre who are going to be uh, interpreting various um, re writings of the Bronte sisters. Uh, they are all wonderful actors and I must tell you, it's really been an amazing experience working with this company of actors on Jane Eyre. I, I really think, um, of all, we've had wonderful people here as you well know, but of all the companies I've worked with in this theater, I, I feel very fortunate to have worked with this group of amazingly talented actors. And these four tonight are exceptional. First, I would like to welcome uh, the lady who plays Bessie, the maid, in our show. She was also our dialect coach and was extremely helpful in getting our dialects authentic, especially because she grew up just 15 miles in England from where the Brontes lived. Please welcome Ruth Moore. The next actress is no stranger to any of you because she's appeared here many times in Nine and in The Secret Garden and this season gloriously in Gigi. And now to make up for all of that, she plays three roles in Jane Eyre. And uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, we may leave some of that out of the bag tonight. But anyway, here she is, the beautiful and talented Glory Crampton. Now, the next gentleman is uh, making his paper mill debut with Jane Eyre. And for those of you who have seen him, uh, you know how wonderful he is. I'm so happy to say that he is going to be back with us playing Dr. Carrasco in Man of La Mancha as well. So you'll be seeing once again the wonderful Tom Hewitt. And the very special lady who is the embodiment of Jane Eyre. You know, I, when I wrote the adaptation, um, I didn't look at any of the films or anything. I just read the novel and worked on the adaptation. And right before we went into rehearsal, I looked at the movies of uh, Jane Eyre, the, the um, Orson Welles film and the recent Zeffirelli film. And I, I was surprised from my experience of reading the novel and what Jane Eyre was about, which we're really going to get into very seriously tonight, I felt that they didn't even begin to capture this incredible heroine that Charlotte Bronte had written. And when we started rehearsal, uh, it was amazing that from the very first reading, there was this electricity, this center, this core to our production, embodied by the great spirit and talent of our leading lady. Please welcome Elizabeth Roby. Now, to begin, uh, I've found out recently, and I think some of you have told at a different symposium, but just to, to reiterate, the five most 
Successful novels of the 19th century in this order were Great Expectations, Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, both of them. So he got two of them. The third one was Vanity Fair by Thackeray. And the fourth was Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. And the fifth was Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Now, it's quite amazing. And when you hear the story of the Brontes tonight, it will be even more amazing that two of the most successful novels, I mean, in the world, in the 19th century, were by these two girls who lived out in the middle of nowhere and wrote under pseudonyms and all kinds of things, which you're going to find out about them. And they actually wrote these novels that changed literature. And we will get into that tonight as well. So just to give you a little sampling of the strange and wonderful writings, we're just going to give you a little potpourri of samples of writings from their novels, from their letters, from the Bronte sisters. Love is stronger than cruelty, stronger than death, but perishes under meanness. Pity may take its place, but pity is not love. Will you be my mistress? No. But I adore you. I do intensely. But I'll never be your mistress. Unloved I love. Unwept I weep. Grief I restrain, hope I repress. Vain is this anguish, fixed and deep. Vainer desires or dreams of bliss. His coming was my hope each day. His parting was my pain. The chance that did his steps delay was ice in every vein. You never felt jealousy, did you, Miss Eyre? Of course not. You've never felt love. You have both sentiments yet to experience. Your soul sleeps. <laughs> the shock is yet to be given which shall waken it. He is not my husband, nor ever will be. He does not love me, I do not love him. Millions of marriages are unhappy. If everybody confessed the truth, perhaps all are more or less so. Probably I shall be an old maid. Oh, could I find her such as I imagine her? Something to tame first and teach afterwards. To break in and then to fondle. Do not be persuaded to marry a man you can never respect. I do not say love, because I think if you can respect a person before marriage, moderate love at least will come after. And as to intense passion, I am convinced that this is no desirable feeling. How many people ever do love, or at least marry for love, in this world? It is a solemn and strange and perilous thing for a woman to become a wife. It would degrade me to marry Heathcliff now, so he shall never know how I love him. Not because he is handsome, Nelly, but because he's more myself than I am. Two words would comprehend my future, death and hell. Existence after losing her would be hell. I find in my husband the tenderest nurse, the kindest support, the best earthly comfort woman ever had. I am your child's mother and your housekeeper, nothing more. Her coming was my hope each day. Her parting was my pain. The chance that did her steps delay was ice in every vein. Reader, I forgave him at that moment and on the spot. Reader, I married him. Lucy, take my love. One day share my life. Be my dearest, first on earth. Do not therefore accuse me of wrong motives when I say that my answer to your proposal must be a decided negative. Good night, Dr. John. You are good. You are beautiful. But you are not mine. Good night, and God bless you. God bless you, my dear master. God keep you from harm and wrong. Direct you, solace you. Reward you well for your past kindness to me. <laughs> 
just some of the words of the Brontes. To put this in perspective, thank you everyone. Jane Austen died in 1817, and Charlotte Bronte was born in 1816. Dickens was born in 1812. So we hear all of these wonderful English names for writers, Dickens, Austen, Thackeray, and then we have this odd name, Bronte. And you know that it's odd because it has two dots over the last E. The, um, but that actually wasn't the real name, and we have to start with the Main, one of the main characters of our story, their father, Patrick, and the last name actually will give his identity away pretty quickly. His real name was Patrick Brunty, and he was born on St. Patrick's Day in Ireland, and he tried so hard to escape his poor Irish roots. He was very poor, he wanted, and he was very bright, and he wanted very desperately to get out of a situation which was intolerable for him. The only thing one could do if one was poor and bright to escape that was to go into the ministry. That was really the only outlet. But he was smart enough to get himself into Cambridge, which was no mean feat in that period of time. So when he, in order to elevate himself, he decided to adopt the name of Bronte, which was much more exciting and romantic than Brunty, which labeled him uh, significantly. He married a woman named Mariah Branwell, who was very different from Patrick. Patrick was very, very uh, aggressive, very outspoken. He was an Irishman through and through. Mariah was very, very quiet. She actually came from a fairly well-to-do family. Her parents had died. She had some inheritance, and uh, she accepted his marriage proposal. And this will give you an idea of their marriage. They were married in 1813. In 1814, Elizabeth, their first daughter, no, sorry, Mariah, their first daughter, was born. In 1815, Elizabeth, the second daughter, was born. In 1816, Charlotte Bronte was born. In 1817, the, oh, the, son, the only son, Patrick Branwell, was born. In 1818, Emily Bronte was born. In 1819, Mr. Bronte went off to a convention. <laughs> and in 1820, the final daughter, Anne, was born. And in 1821, Mrs. Bronte died, and who could blame her? <laughs> Just before she died, the, uh, Patrick Bronte got finally the post that he'd been waiting for. He had wanted to uh, rise in the world and to really achieve something significant, but unfortunately, he received his ultimate punishment. His, um, he was sent to be the minister uh, of Haworth which was located way up in the Yorkshire Moors uh, in a very desolate area. And basically, he knew when he went there that his uh, future was pretty bleak. We have here uh, an example of uh, a picture of the Yorkshire Moors. And this is how Charlotte would later describe it. Um, I think, can you see that, Ruth? You OK? This is how she would describe it later on when she first came there as a six, uh, six, four-year-old, five-year-old child. The scenery for some miles before we reached Haworth was wild and uncultivated, with hardly any population. The scenery of these hills is not grand. It is not romantic. It is scarcely striking. Mills and scattered cottages chase romance from these valleys. Now, Haworth, just so we're clear on this, because everybody may not realize that Haworth is spelled H-A-W-O-R-T-H. And you know you know about the Brontes if you say Haworth as opposed to Haworth or Hayworth. And um, Ruth grew up very near to there. This is actually the, uh, a picture in the 19th century of the parsonage house that the family Bronte lived in. The, it was a one-road town. It wound up a steep hill. And the, the church and the parsonage house were at the top of this hill and the moors beyond it. Now, the interesting thing, and you must imagine this because it's quite profound if you think about it. The house, first of all, you must remember there was no indoor plumbing, right? So there's this one little privy outside, and um, the house was surrounded from every window. No matter where you looked out of the house, you saw tombstones because the house was in the middle of a graveyard. <laughs> so it's no wonder these girls all turned out to be so morbid. But in addition to this, which is unfortunate, 
the well was very shallow, and with the privy and the well being in the middle of a graveyard, um, the physical and the health conditions of the place were really poor, and this is going to become a big part of our story as we go along. Um, in fact, Mr. Bronte himself was so um, severe, he felt that people should, uh, the only way they could really handle life was to have deprivation and the, the barest minimum. There were no curtains, there were no carpets, the house was very severe, very cold, that all these children were growing up in. Uh, and actually, if we can turn it over to Ruth for a moment, maybe you can tell us a little more about the geography of that area. Um, Howarth is situated right on the edge of the Pennines, and the Pennines are a range of hills that are absolutely startling in their bleakness. They're really extensive. I think you, you may have a little map there in your material. Yes. You may want to see exactly where it's located. It's in the West Riding of Yorkshire, and these hills are characterized by great outcrops of rocks and crags and wizened trees and stunted grass. It's, um, it's a very dramatic landscape. It's not pretty, but it's breathtaking. Um, and another thing about that area is it's always cold. If you go to Howarth, you approach the parsonage by a, a long, steep, almost vertical road, and you get up to the top uh, where the parsonage is, and it just opens out onto this vast wilderness. And it, it never stops blowing a gale there. It's always cold. Um, it's very wild. I grew up about 15 miles away in a similar sort of hilltop village. Howarth to me is more like a village than a town. But it does have the industry, the old woolen mills around. So it's, it's characterized as a town. But it's very small. And the stone is very dark. There's a sort of dismal, depressive um, atmosphere to Howarth. Um, there's a gloom to it. <laughs> I'm fond of it, though. <laughs> um, actually, if you go to visit there now, the parsonage is surrounded by trees, and the, a lot of the graves have been moved much further away. But at the time, there were no trees whatsoever, and the graves were all around the house. And that's where the children would play in the, among the gravestones. So, to continue, let's see the next slide. This is a picture of Patrick Bronte. If we can, can we see that? Are the lights down enough? The, uh, as you, you can see how quite severe he was, and he wore this very high uh, neck cowl thing, and it got higher as he got older. He kept growing up until it was sort of covering his face. Um, he was really a very strange man. I mean, there have been many things written about him, uh, whether or not the severity that he's been portrayed as was all true, but nevertheless, some of the facts are, uh, you just have to go along with them and make up your own mind. He, um, after his wife died, Actually, before, let me to explain that. Let's see the picture of Maria. Maria, I'm sorry, that's the wife. She was a lovely, delicate little thing, as you can see. And she would actually die of a, a cancer when she, uh, after she had borne her six children. Um, when she was dying, she asked to have her wedding gown placed at the foot of the bed, an heirloom wedding gown that had been handed down through the family, to give her some release from her pain. She wanted something to think about in happier days. It, when she had that wedding gown there, Patrick Bronte at one point burned the wedding gown in front of her, saying that he felt that she could not be released from this world as long as she was uh, focusing on the finer things in life. And it would be better if she didn't. So he burned it. Um, some say that at that time, uh, he would have been thought of as a good and devoted husband, but nowadays I think we would think of him as a psychopath. <laughs> he. Um, he always carried a gun. He always had it strapped on him, and the children from an early age saw him with his pistol. And he would very frequently go out on the back porch of the house and fire it off, especially at meals. And the children, he never ate with the children. He always ate in a separate, in a separate study. For 40 years, he, he never took meals with the rest of the family. The children were left to eat, and they ate very poor meals. It's a debate whether or not they ever actually had any meat, although some seem to say that, yes, there must have been some meat. But they, again, needed to be deprived and to learn how to be hardy through this deprivation. The next picture is the lady who came to run the house. This is Mariah's sister. This is their aunt, Branwell. And you can see from her picture, she probably was a lot like Patrick. They had two very severe, uh, we have, you know, our little picture of the American Gothic couple. I think this was the English Gothic couple. <laughs> and fiercely Methodist. Throw it in, Barry. Uh, yeah, the Aunt Branwell was fiercely Methodist. 
love to school the children in the Bible, uh, have them memorize verses, talk about the Bible all the time. Although at the same time, she also brought, uh, brought into the house wonderful magazines from London. Oh, is, is that his mic up? Hello? There you go. Okay. Um, Mariah, I mean, Dan Bramwell would be quite an interesting character in their lives, as you'll see. Even though she was quite stern, she does play an important part in the girls' lives later on. Um, and as we talk about what's happening here in their lives, we will talk a lot about the role of women at this point in time. And it's, it's very interesting. Uh, it was totally a male-dominated society, which of course we know, but when we get into that, we'll just see how much the woman needed to be emancipated and emerge and how it was begun very distinctively by Charlotte. Um, so, uh, Aunt Branwell was there, uh, Patrick Bronte, who also was quite depressed after the death of his wife, very withdrawn from the family, and these were very young children, you must remember at that time, so at, at that time in child rearing, uh, you really didn't get to know your kids till they were teenagers, you know, you really let somebody else bring them up. So, what they decided to do was to send the four oldest girls to school. And this is quite an infamous situation. The two oldest girls went first, Mariah and Elizabeth, and soon after, Emily and Charlotte would follow. This school, if we can see the next slide, was called Cohen Bridge. And it would become the model for Lowood School in Jane Eyre. And I must tell you, as we go through tonight, Jane Eyre originally was titled an autobiography. And almost every detail in Jane Eyre can be traced to some incident in Charlotte Bronte's life. It's quite remarkable, and I think that's one of the reasons why the book was so amazing, because it was so truthful. It wasn't this frivolous, romantic fiction. It really hit home in so many ways, and especially with this school, Cohen Bridge. Um, if we can see the next slide, this is uh, Mr. Brocklehurst. The man who ran uh, Cohen Bridge, his name was uh, Karis Wilson. And he was, Brocklehurst was absolutely, Brocklehurst, I'm saying Brocklehurst. Brocklehurst was absolutely a model of Karis Wilson. Karis Wilson uh, had written a little book for uh, schoolgirls to instruct them in um, how to deal with uh, the trials of life. One of them was called The Friendly Visitor, and it was about how one should welcome a holy death in favor of an unholy life, and talk extensively about the sins that little girls could commit, and if they did, of course, they would end up in hell. And it's important to remember that the Victorians loved uh, anthologies of deathbed scenes, and particularly anthologies of children dying were highly popular and, and just much distributed to children, particularly in Methodist and Baptist and what were called dissenting houses. That is to say, people who were either evangelical in the Church of England or uh, outside the Church of England. It was very hard. I mean, can you imagine the bedtime stories these children heard? <laughs> um, so Lowood School, there were over 60 girls, I mean, in Co Cohen Bridge, Lowood. If I say the same, you know it's the same school we're talking about. You must remember this. Now we're talking about this, the, the situation here, the outdoor privy, there was one for 60 girls and all of the teachers. It was, the school was, and this is why Charlotte would name Lowood, Lowood, because it sat very low by a river. So you can imagine where the underground water was running, and the privy would infect the well and their water supply, and of course this typhoid, the typhus epidemic, was a real situation, it really broke out. And um, just like in the, in the book, and it was from these horrifying conditions. Uh, if we can take the next slide, this is actually a picture of Karis Wilson, which we'll explain a little more about in a little bit. Uh, this is drawn by Charlotte, I believe. Yes. Charlotte. Charlotte drew this picture of, of Mr. Wilson looking pretty stern. And if we can go to the next slide. The, the incident in Lowood, which would become so profound and be the, one of the most touching parts of the Book of Jane Eyre, was Helen Burns' a, a relationship to Miss Scatcherd. When the famous biography of Charlotte Bronte came out uh, after Charlotte's death by Mrs. Gaskell, she would report in her book uh, a situation that existed there where Mariah, which was Charlotte's oldest sister, who is the model for Helen Burns, 
where Mariah, who was quite sick, quite weak, and quite an angelic child, uh, experienced uh, the same things that Miss Scatcher would. In the book, Mrs. Gaskell actually refers to this teacher as Miss Scatcher because she didn't say the real name's teacher. And this is an excerpt from uh, Mrs. Gaskell's biography of the situation with Mariah, the oldest daughter, at the school at Cohen Bridge. The dormitory in which Mariah slept was a long room holding a row of narrow little beds on each side. Mariah's bed stood nearest to the door of this room. One morning after Mariah had become so seriously unwell with her consumption, when the getting up bell was heard, poor Mariah moaned out that she was ill, so very ill she wished she might stay in bed. Some of the girls urged her to do so and said they would explain it all to Miss Temple. But Miss Scatchard was close at hand and her anger would have to be faced before Miss Temple's thoughtfulness could interfere. So the sick child began to dress, shivering with cold. Just then Miss Scatchard issued from her room and without asking for a word of explanation from the sick and frightened child, took her by the arm and by one vigorous movement whirled her out into the middle of the floor, abusing her all the time for dirty and untidy habits. When Mariah, in slow, trembling movements, with many a pause, went downstairs at last, she was punished for being late. This is what really happened to Charlotte's sister. Helen uh, and Mariah died as a result of the conditions at the school. And Elizabeth, the second daughter, would die very shortly after her, the first daughter. Charlotte, at six years old, was there to witness the death of her two sisters. So, now Charlotte Bronte is the oldest Bronte child. And I'd like to tell you, oh, well, before we do, I think it's interesting to um, think about how the children reacted to the grief of losing their two oldest sisters, little children lo losing their older brother and si their older two sisters, it's quite profound. And Branwell actually wrote a poem about this situation, and this is an excerpt from that poem. How bitter seemed the moment when earth's ceremonies o'er, we from the filled grave turned again to leave her evermore. He was nine years old when he wrote that. Um, so Branwell, Patrick Branwell, the son, was the hope of the family. He was everything a child could be. He was adorable, he was clever, he was personable, he would talk to anybody. Uh, just people loved Branwell. He was the most wonderful child, and the father put all of his hope in his son. He, um, he actually sort of dismissed the three girls, because girls weren't really meant to do all that much, and he was, the son was the son, and he was everything. Charlotte, uh, which is very interesting, and which you must realize, Charlotte was ugly. She was very, very, very little. In fact, when you had your uh, exhibit, you showed her gloves, exactly. and how big were they? Oh, exceptionally tiny, very small, very small hands. Very tiny. Yes. She was probably less than five feet tall. Less than five feet tall. She wore Coke bottle glasses, you know, she, she really was, could barely see. Um, she also, during her life, would experience losing most of her teeth because she had problems. I mean, she really was a physical mess. But she was, had an unbelievable spirit. She had this drive about her, this, this thing which you see in Jane Eyre, and this was Charlotte talking just from her heart, as Charlotte would be, as you'll find out as we go along. Emily was quite beautiful. She was five foot six. The, in fact, Randall was only five foot three, even though he was adorable, but he was like an adorable leprechaun as opposed to. <laughs> um, but Emily was the beauty. She was, however, she was almost um, pathologically shy. She really could not talk in company with strangers, only with her family. She did indeed wander for hours on the moor in quite ecstatic out on the moors. And so she was really the opposite in personality from Charlotte. Anne was quite a pretty little girl and quite sort of uh, just in the middle. She was a nice child. She had no real personality emerging yet because she was the baby. And we'll be interested to see where she goes as we go along here. So uh, Patrick Bronte went off to another convention. And when he returned, he brought a present for Branwell. This present would change the course of their lives and history. The present was a gift of 12 wooden soldiers. 
And instead of playing war with these soldiers, Branwell divided them up among his sisters. He had to play with them because there was nobody else to play with. And this incredible thing began. The two, uh, Branwell and Charlotte divided up, and Emily and Anne, they divided on either side, and they began to create stories using these soldiers as their heroes, and they named them all, and this is when their writing careers began. And I'll turn it over to Robert now, and he'll tell you about what's now become known as the juvenile. Though the uh, soldiers were given to uh, nine-year-old Branwell, uh, Charlotte later reported that uh, the sisters, who uh, were then 10, Charlotte was 10, Emily eight, and Anne six, responded just as enthusiastically as uh, had Branwell, each taking the soldier for her, her own. Uh, these toy soldiers engendered years of imaginative play and inspired the Bronte's artistry, literary as well as uh, pictorial. Uh, this slide shows a selection of the really extraordinary tiny books that uh, provide the record of their childhood world and early artistic development. Barry brought this along with him. This That's is the life size. actual size of the books that they wrote with as much as 2,000 tiny little words written in the books. Uh, the handmade books really are tiny, some of inch, uh, inch and a half uh, by, a, by an inch. Uh, fortunately, uh, quite a number of them uh, survive, uh, several in the Morgan Library, uh, others in uh, research libraries throughout the United States and at the Bronte Parsonage in, uh, in uh, Howard. Uh, the writing in them is, uh, because of their tiny size, is therefore minuscule but it's uh, completely legible. Uh, the size of these books was uh, partially practical. Paper was not plentiful in the uh, Bronte household, and the tiny writing uh, made maximum use of a really rather scarce resource. It also, uh, the size of the books also preserved for the children their own private world, uh, accessible to prying, adult eyes only by considerable strain. Later curatorial eyes only by considerable strain. Now what they wrote in these books were, were uh, a wonderful series of uh, stories. Uh, uh, in, initially, uh, all four collaborated on a single saga with exotic locales and a huge cast of characters. But eventually, Branwell and Charlotte uh, went their own way with tales of places uh, with names like Verdopolis and Angria. No, while and Angria, and Angria. Angria. Because Ch Charlotte would later be called one of the angriest writers right. of all time. <laughs> while Emily and Anne evolved their own world, which they called uh, Gondor. Now, where did they get the idea for it? The ideas for it for these uh, stories. We've heard uh, that the Reverend Bronte was really very severe. We know that he was a, he was a fundamentalist, and yes, indeed, he was very strict on religious matters. But he was also very fond of literature and very much interested in current events. Uh, the parsonage was full of uh, reading matter. And the children were uh, surrounded by books and became voracious. Uh, really voracious readers. Uh, they derived their heroes, heroines, and thoughts not only from the books that you would expect to find in a clergyman's home, the, the Bible, uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, Bunyan's Pilgrim's uh, Progress, but also uh, books like The Arabian Nights, uh, the novels of Sir Walter Scott, uh, and the poetry, especially the poetry of Lord Byron. Uh, an example from one of Charlotte's stories of the kind of writing you might find in these childhood uh, efforts. Uh, Charlotte, 12 year old Charlotte, describes a palace as being of the purest white marble. Around it lay a wide garden which stretched over all the country as far as the range of hills. Here, the tufted olive, the fragrant myrtle, the stately palm tree, the graceful almond, and the queenly rose mingled in sweet and odorous shadings. Now that's certainly reminiscent of the, uh, the Arabian Nights. The children also drew on events of the day as reported in the Blackwoods magazines and other magazines. Charlotte and Branwell were especially uh, enthralled by the military exploits of the uh, Duke of Wellington. Now they channeled not only their literary interests, but also their artistic talents into, the, into their imaginary, into these imaginary worlds. They could all draw, uh, we'll see in the next slide. Often, 
they would uh, copy portraits from illustrations in books and magazines, rena renaming the subjects as characters uh, from their imaginary uh, kingdoms. Uh, this is a drawing by Branwell of one of his most prominent, his and Charlotte's most prominent heroes, the Duke of Zamorna. And let's hear some more of the really quite right, florid language that these and, children And they were how old when they wrote this? Uh, they were about in their early, early teens? Their very early teens, yes. very early teens. Listen to their fantasy as uh, we hear this excerpt from their writings. Zamorna entered the house as the fairy-like voice of a musical clock in the passage struck out its symphony to the pendulum. Miss Laurie met her master as he entered. His cold lip pressed to her forehead, and his colder hand clasping hers brought the sensation which it was her custom of weeks and months to wait for. She hardly felt that his arm had encircled her waist, and yet she did feel it too, and would have thought herself presumptuous to shrink from his endearment. She took it as a slave ought to take the caress of a sultan, and obeying the gentle effort of his hand, slowly sank onto the sofa by her master's side. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most interesting things I think about these books uh, is that especially the collaboration of, uh, the collaborations of Charlotte and Bramwell is that they sometimes showed competitiveness. Charlotte would write of an act of heroism of one of her favorite characters, for example, Charles Wellesley is the name of one of her characters, which uh, Branwell would then describe in his contribution as a little reptile and depict Charles Wellesley committing some act of great villainy. Uh, sometimes Branwell would kill off one of Charlotte's characters, only to have her contrive a miraculous resurrection in her next episode. Uh, Branwell and Charlotte continued their collaborations, though less frequently, and at least on Charlotte's part, a bit less enthusiastically into uh, young adulthood. Uh, like uh, Branwell, the sisters uh, also drew with some accomplishment. And I'm going to speak just very briefly about each of the, uh, each of the, the Bronte children uh, with their own artwork uh, as uh, illustrations. Uh, the next slide. Yes, that's right, that's correct. Uh, Branwell had been uh, trained, as Robert mentioned, uh, had been formally trained as an artist. Uh, this is his last known drawing from about two months before his death. <clears throat> According to Branwell's inscription, uh, the drawing uh, depicts two famous boxers of the day, Jack Shaw and Jack Painter, but it can certainly be interpreted as Branwell's premonition of his own death. Uh, there is a figure huddled in bed, half covered with blankets, uh, approached by death in the form of a skeleton. Now, Branwell, whose attempted careers as painter, poet, and tutor had come to naught, was uh, at this time uh, very uh, despondent. This uh, was uh, 1848. He was financially entangled in debt and physically weakened by uh, heavy drinking. He died, probably of consumption, at home at Howard Parsonage on September 24th, 1848, uh, when he was 31 years old. In a letter, uh, now also now in the Morgan Library's collection, written just over a month after his death, uh, Charlotte observed, Branwell was his father's and his sister's pride and hope in boyhood, but since manhood, the case has been otherwise. I do not weep from the sense of bereavement, but for the wreck of talent, the ruin of promise, the untimely, dreary extinction of what might have been a burning and a shining light. Uh, next, we will see a slide of, uh, which gives us an example of Emily's artistic talent. Uh, and this is, I think, a really quite wonderful portrait of her sister Anne's spaniel, uh, whose name was uh, Flossie. Uh, Emily has drawn her sister's dog in what, was the, what would have been a very recognizable style of uh, engravings and prints in uh, magazines and books at the time. Uh, Flossie uh, outlived her, her mistress Anne by uh, several years. Uh, next slide. Emily also painted her own dog, uh, Keeper, who was a part Labrador. Uh, Keeper's devotion to Emily was made famous by uh, Charlotte's uh, biographer, uh, whom uh, uh, Robert mentioned, Elizabeth Gaskell, who uh, reported in her biography of Charlotte that Keeper had followed Emily's coffin to the grave and howled for many nights following outside Emily's bedroom door. Uh, next slide. Uh, this uh, portrait of Emily 
was done by uh, her brother Branwell and was part of a larger uh, portrait that Branwell, uh, in which Branwell had included uh, himself and uh, Anne and Charlotte, but the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the uh, portrait was prob probably destroyed and only this portion showing Emily uh, survives. Emily became ill with uh, consumption in 1848, not long after Brandon's death. And she, she adamantly refused medical care and spurned assistance from Charlotte and Anne, even going about her uh, household duties on the uh, day that she, uh, that she died. Uh, she died on December 19, 1848, just uh, it was less than three months actually after Brandon's death. Uh, several months later, Charlotte wrote uh, again to her friend, uh, Ellen Nussie, uh, a letter about uh, referring to uh, Emily's death, in which Charlotte referred to what uh, she called the agony of forced neglect because of Emily's stubborn refusal to accept uh, medical care. Uh, Charlotte wrote, never may we be doomed to feel such agony again. It was terrible. And of course, uh, about a year later, uh, uh, another death was to, uh, was to occur. Uh, the next slide is a portrait of uh, Anne, uh, which was done by Charlotte when Anne was about 13 uh, years old. Uh, the next slide uh, shows an example of uh, Anne's, uh, in the next slide, there's an example of Anne's uh, work as a, uh, as a draftsman. Uh, this is really a very finely drawn uh, landscape. Uh, it was probably done when Anne was a pupil at Rowhead School in about 1836. Uh, she very likely kept such drawings from her school days as a kind of uh, portfolio to demonstrate to prospective em uh, employers her competence as a, a teacher of art. And as some of you will probably recall in her novel, The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, her heroine, Helen Huntington, is, a, is depicted as an artist of uh, just such landscapes as, uh, as this. And of course, a uh, heroine's artistic talent figures very importantly in Jane Eyre. Uh, within weeks of Emily's death, Anne too became seriously ill. Unlike Emily, she did allow a medical treatment and briefly showed signs of improvement. However, by the beginning of May uh, 1849, uh, death was imminent. Uh, Charlotte reluctantly agreed to accompany Anne on a final visit to Scarborough, the seaside town on the Yorkshire uh, coast that Anne uh, dearly loved. Anne died at the end of May, uh, 29 years of age, and was buried uh, in a churchyard uh, overlooking, overlooking the sea. And you, on your handout uh, on the dates of the Brontes, please correct Anne's death date to 1849 instead of uh, 1848. Of the siblings, uh, Charlotte, the surviving sister, demonstrated not only the best health, uh, but also the fiercest determination to have a career as a writer. She loathed the, prof the profession of her heroine, Jane Eyre, a governess. In a letter uh, in the library's collection, she confided to her good friend, Ellen Nussie, her intense dislike of her first experiences as a governess. Uh, she wrote this particular letter in pencil uh, she told Ellen because if she wrote in ink, she would have had to get up from her desk, go into the drawing room where she, to, to get ink, well, where, and if she went to the drawing room, she would see, she might see one or another members of the family whom she really loved, the family that had uh, employed her. Uh, she wrote to Ellen, I will pour out the long history of a private governess's trials and crosses in her first situation. I ask you to imagine the miseries of a reserved wretch like me, thrown all at once into the midst of a large family, having the charge given me of a set of pampered, spoiled, and turbulent children, whom I was expected constantly to amuse as well as instruct. Charlotte kept this, uh, this job for about uh, two months. And uh, <laughs> though none, none of her further attempts at teaching fulfilled her, they certainly provided uh, fine material for her, her novels. And of course, we meet some of these pampered, spoiled children among uh, Rochester's guests in uh, Jane uh, Eyre. Uh, the next slide. Uh, Charlotte drew on other experiences for, for her uh, fiction. 
Uh, as, uh, as Robert pointed out earlier, uh, some people have pointed out that this uh, portrait resembles Mr. Brocklehurst in uh, Jane Eyre. Uh, <clears throat> And we certainly know that she based the tyrannical, evangelical Mr. Bocklehurst in Lowood School on uh, her own terrible experiences at, uh, at, uh, Cohen, at Cohen Bridge School. Um, uh, the final slide in this particular section uh, is a portrait by uh, Branwell of, uh, his, uh, of, his, uh, of his three, uh, of his three uh, sisters. Uh, and it is really through uh, Charlotte's letters and diaries that we see just how close-knit uh, this, family, this family was. Uh, one of my favorite objects in the Morgan Library's collection is a geography textbook which belonged to Charlotte uh, when she studied uh, languages in Brussels in 1842-1843. Beset with homesickness and unrequited uh, love for, for uh, her teacher, she used the inside cover of the book as a diary to record her mood one day. And it's uh, this little entry inside the cover of her book is in that same very tiny handwriting that she had learned to use when uh, she and her, her siblings were writing their uh, childhood stories. Uh, and she wrote uh, one a morning, October 1843, first class. I am very cold. There is no fire. I wish I were at home with Papa, Randall, Emily, and Anne. I am tired of being amongst foreigners. It is a dreary life, especially as there is only one person in this house worthy of being liked. Also another who seems a rosy sugar plum, but I know her to be colored chalk. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was lovely. Now. The interesting thing about this portrait, this is Charlotte on the left. You can see she's taking her glasses off and her eyes are bugging out a little bit. <laughs> and Emily is the tall one, and then Anne. And that smudge in the middle was where Branwell was, but he wiped himself out of the portrait, which is quite metaphoric, because he was actually wiping himself out of their lives physically, because not only was he addicted to alcohol, he was seriously addicted to opium. And at that time, opium was less expensive than alcohol. And actually, they didn't really realize how dangerous opium was at that time, and people were uh, into using opium as an escape. Unfortunately, he became very addicted to it, and he could never shake this addictive behavior. So uh, he knew he had become a failure in everybody's eyes, and he was wiped out. Now, if we could look at the next slide, John Reed, the obnoxious young man who is uh, uh, Jane Eyre's nemesis at the uh, home in Gateshead, a lot of his character may have been uh, provided by Bramwell because John Reed will eventually die of dissipation uh, in the story of Jane Eyre, as Bramwell would do. And I'm sure Bramwell, in his fiery moods, would have tormented his sisters as John Reed did. Uh, so there's a lot of Branwell in John Reed, and, uh, and there's also a lot of Branwell later on, as we'll find out, in Emily's hero, or anti-hero, depending on how you want to look at it, Heathcliff. Um, now, it's interesting that Branwell, of all the children, was actually taught at home. His father took the responsibility for a lot of the teaching of his own son, but the girls he kept sending off to school. It, no matter how much, many of them he knocked off, you know, they'd still send them off. So the next slide, oh, this is just another slide of the Reed family. Uh, in our production, and you see John Reed there and the daughters and Jane standing up to Mr. Brocklehurst, and we'll talk in a moment a little more about her becoming a governess. So the, uh, if we can actually look at the next slide, this is the school, the second school then that Emily and Charlotte were, were sent to, Rowhead. This was a school that could help prepare both of those daughters for becoming a governess, as we talked about. And they needed to have proper skills in order to be a governess, to know languages, to a certain extent drawing, things that they could do, and a lot of the drawing they learned at this school, so that they could properly teach others. It was at this school that Charlotte met a teacher named Miss Wookler who would become her model for Miss Temple and became a lifelong friend of hers, and that Miss Temple would then appear later on in Lowood School in the novel. The next slide is a picture of Miss Temple, who was one of her uh, dear friends and who actually helped in the story of Jane Eyre, helps Jane Eyre to 
learn more about the true nature of love. Um, this is, in the next picture please, this is actually a portrait of Charlotte, looking quite attractive in this picture actually, so it may have been a little flattering, but maybe she had good days, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> but this was a description of one of the schoolmates when Charlotte arrived at Rowhead. This is what one of the young ladies had to wrote about meeting Charlotte. She looked like a little old woman, so short-sighted that she always appeared to be seeking something and moving her head from side to side to catch a sight of it. When a book was given her, she dropped her head till her nose nearly touched it. It was not possible to keep from laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and the next slide shows our heroine Jane Eyre, Elizabeth, looking a lot like Charlotte in this picture. Um, <laughs> Jane, uh, Charlotte would have a lifelong friend in Ellen Lucy, who we've already mentioned. Ellen, she met Ellen at Rowhead School, and uh, she would become quite a friend. Ellen lived in a, uh, an estate known as Ridings, which would also become one of the models for Thornfield. There were a couple of different homes that, that Charlotte would visit, nice homes that weren't nothing like hers. Uh, when she would go with girls home from their schooling, they would visit, and she started to get impressions. Ridings was surrounded by thorn trees, which of course become Thorn Field. And also at Riding, there was a gigantic chestnut tree, which in fact had been hit by lightning and was quite a remarkable tree, and she also brings that into the novel, as well as there was a, a legend of a mad woman who had lived in this house. And actually, if you look back on several of her other experiences, there are actually about three different places that she visited. All of them had legends of mad women that had been kept there. As you know, at that time, uh, people that had various forms of handicaps, mental retardation, or madness were often locked off somewhere and just fed, and kept. Uh, it's, it's actually not quite too surprising. I know if you re remember recently, just about a couple months ago, they found someone in Spain that had been left in a hole for 40 years that the family had kept feeding. You know, that they had just kept them there because whatever the actual problem, they have to try to figure it out now because the person was still alive. But this was what was going on, and the mystery and it must have been quite amazing around her. It was at this time, however, that Charlotte received her first proposal of marriage from Ellen Lucy's brother, Henry. And uh, Charlotte actually writes to her friend, Ellen, about the experience of uh, Henry, and this is what she had to say about it. Henry says he is comfortably settled at Donington, that his health is much improved, and that it is his intention to take pupils after Easter. He then intimates that in due time, he should want a wife to take care of his pupils. And frankly, asks me to be that wife. A wife to look after pupils? I had not and could not have the intense attachment which would make me willing to die for him. And if I ever marry, it must be in that light of adoration that I will regard my husband. She had quite high expectations. <laughs> Um, she would actually receive another proposal from another clergyman. Actually, she received three proposals in her life, all from clergymen. Um, and the next one was quite similar. All of the proposals that Charlotte received in her life came as a total surprise. She didn't see them coming. And out of the blue, these various people would say, hey, how about being my wife? We'll get into what actually happened to the third one, which is most interesting. But as you can imagine, when St. John Rivers in Jane Eyre asks, Jane out of the blue to marry him and go off to India and be a missionary because she's perfect to serve the people because she's suited, much more suited for labor than for love. Uh, this was all something Charlotte really knew about. Um, now, the idea of a governess, just to elaborate on this a little bit more because we think of governesses as being quite romantic and charming after the sound of music. But in those days, a governess was about the lowest position any woman could hold. If you were poor and smart, that was about the only job you could hold, and everybody knew you were poor, and if you were also not very attractive, it was a real problem, because the family, the, the family themselves didn't want you around them at dinner and all that sort of thing because you weren't a charming little attractive thing to have around, and the servants downstairs resented you because you got paid a little bit more than they did to sit around and talk French and do these things with the students, and they didn't like that at all. So, the governess was quite an outcast in this situation. It's important to remember that governesses in the 19th century were always middle class women. They weren't servants. They had the same status as the people who they worked for, except they were working for wages. 
And the idea of being a governess was a total compromise because it suggested that you were unmarriageable. And a woman in the 19th century who was middle class, her only career was either marriage or to be a governess or a teacher, neither one of which were held in high esteem. Exactly. Important. And the other thing to remember is the students that they would be called to be the governess for. Rich families could all afford to send their children to very fine schools. So the only reason their children were at home and needed a governess was because there was something wrong with them. <laughs> Either they had um, severe learning disabilities or they were uh, sent back because they were unruly and disagreeable and they couldn't be controlled. There was something wrong with those kids. So in addition, they had, th there it was a very bad match, these governesses, with the children that they would be stuck with. Uh, the Sidgwick family, which was where Charlotte went, as we've already heard, she, this is where actually the son, Bernie, threw a Bible at her, which John Reed, you know, smacks Jane around with a book early in the, in the novel, and this actually had happened to Jane. She'd had stones thrown at her, I mean to Charlotte. I, if I confuse that, you'll forgive me, but they are set rather inseparable. However, as we've also noted, Charlotte was quite opinionated about how things should work and quite not the little passive, this is how I'm going to take being a governess. She really would speak her mind. And Elizabeth Barrett Browning would later be heard to remark just about the, what it would be like to have Charlotte as a governess. The idea of having such a savage, free-thinking person as a governess. <laughs> free thinking. God forbid in those days that a woman should have free thoughts. And Florence Nightingale would later write uh, an interesting quote which really must have had uh, summed up Charlotte's philosophy in her mind at this time. Why have women, passion, intellect, moral activity, these three, and a place in society where not one of the three can be exercised? So Charlotte was not successful as a governess, and neither was Emily. I mean, Emily was horrifying because she couldn't deal with people at all. So. Both girls were uh, sent back to the parsonage, and so the next big scheme was that they would start a school in Haworth themselves. In order to do this, they needed to know a few more languages and have a few more accomplishments, so they were sent to a school in Brussels to learn these things. So they go off over there, and remarkably, the one person who, meanwhile, you know, Grandma's just out drinking and doing his opium and everything, and suddenly, Anne becomes the great success. She becomes a governess at Thorpe Green for the family Robinson, and they love her. She's quite attractive, she's quite patient, she's really the perfect governess, and she is incredibly successful. So they say, well, you're taking care of our little girls. It's too bad we don't have somebody like you to take care of our little boy. And she said, aha, my brother Branwell can do that, and Branwell goes to Thorpe Green as well. So the two of them are in Thorpe Green, and the two other sisters are in Brussels. Now starts the real drama. Charlotte falls in love with her professor, Monsieur Heger, who is married. He has no real interest in her, but she is madly infatuated with him. He, he likes her very much as a student because she is incredibly intelligent and bright and smart, and he really enjoys her. But this infatuation gets to be quite sticky because she writes him letters and really expresses her infatuation for him, which he shares everything with his wife. His wife ultimately told the husband that she actually had torn off all the letters, but she hadn't. She'd saved them all, and we, those letters still survive, and we actually see some of the things that Charlotte wrote. So she was totally infatuated. It was a disaster, and she was sent home. She and Emily were sent home. Meanwhile, Bramwell didn't realize that what he was supposed to do was actually tutor the son. What he thought he was supposed to do was have an affair with the wife. <laughs> so. Mr. Robinson finds out, and he gets rid of him right away and packs Anne off as well. So Anne is furious with her brother. They both lost the job. It's actually very mysterious. What exactly happened is all covered in mystery because Mr. Robinson refers simply to this horrible thing that happened, and it cannot be talked about, and he sends him off. Daphne de Murier, the author of Rebecca, would later allude to the fact that possibly Branwell maybe even got involved with the son. It's all very dark and and mysterious what happened. But anyway, they're sent home. The four children have come home in disgrace. They are at the lowest point in their lives. You can imagine how much opium and Bramwell, uh, alcohol Bramwell took at this time. So Charlotte, always the one to say, how are we going to get out of this? She suddenly discovers that her sisters have written poetry. And it's, she thinks it's quite good. And she's written some herself. So she comes up with this scheme 
which is uh, helped by the fact that right at this point, their Aunt Branwell dies, and she leaves a legacy to the three girls. She leaves no money to Branwell, so she must have not cared for him too much, but she didn't leave any to him. She left it to the girls, knowing how much women in this time period would need it to get on in the world. And so with this legacy, they get their poems published. They pay for them to be published by a vanity press. Uh, it, they, they get this all worked out. The poems are published under pseudonyms. It's at this point that they choose the name Kerr, Bell, Acton, Bell, and Ellis Bell. Kerr for Charlotte, Ellis for Emily, and Acton for Anne. And um, they have 1,000 copies printed, and only two of them sold. <laughs> and nobody really knows actually who bought the two copies, because see, none of their friends knew they wrote them. They would remain secret authors for a very long time, as we'll find out. And actually, if any of you had come across one of those copies that had been sold, you would really be rich today. But um, so it was at this point that uh, Charlotte was at quite a low point, and this is something she wrote to her friend Ellen. I shall be 31 next birthday. My youth is gone like a dream, and very little use have I ever made of it. What have I done these last 30 years? Precious little. But Charlotte was not one to give up. So she said, okay, our poems did not sell. So why don't we write novels? And so she got her sisters to all write novels and they would sit around in the evening and critique each other. They did the same thing with their poems. And uh, Anne would write Agnes Gray, Emily would write Wuthering Heights, and Jane, I mean Charlotte would write The Professor. These three novels were sent out and to everybody to try to get received. They received more rejection notices than you can imagine. One rejection after another. Rejection, rejection, rejection. They still sent it out. And actually, the publisher who would finally accept one of these novels finally said it really was rather ridiculous because they didn't even put them in a fresh envelope. They just had the place they'd already sent it crossed out, the next one, and by the time they got it, they're already listed. Eight publishers had been crossed out before they got to them. <laughs> Nevertheless, Anne and Emily's novels were accepted by a, a publisher named Newby. He did not like the professor, but he was willing to publish their novels if they each paid 50 pounds themselves to have them published, which was the equivalent of about $3,000 at that time. So they were paying for most of the publication. Again, that vanity press thing. This floundered along. The plan was there, but these books did not come out in print right away. However, the most amazing thing happened. A man named William Smith Williams who uh, was a literary, who read the literature for a publishing company, came upon her novel, The Professor, and he wrote her back the nicest rejection notice anyone ever got. He said, uh, I cannot, we are not interested in your novel, but you have talent, and if you will just write something more exciting, please send it to us to let us look at first. And of course, that's what Charlotte does. She sits right down and writes Jane Eyre. Now what happens though, in this writing, which is quite interesting and, and, and sad in a way, her father now had cataracts, very serious cataracts, and he had to go for a cataract operation. Now you can imagine in that time period what it was like. There was no anesthetic. There were no lasers. And he was a cantankerous person to begin with, let alone when he's half blind, or mostly blind, and Charlotte has to go with him for this operation. After she has to be in the room with him when he's operated on and witness it, then he has to be taken to a room, and for four days he is put in a vice, essentially, so that he cannot move because he can't risk jarring what the operation has done in case it will be awful. She's sitting there with him, taking care of him, and at this time she goes into trances, and out of the trances she begins to write Jane Eyre. And it's no wonder that at the end Mr. Rochester becomes blind. So, the, she sends off the novel, and the... Um, William Smith Williams likes it. He gives it to the publisher. The publisher starts to read. He says, I'll read the first two chapters. He reads the first two chapters. He says to his secretary, here's a man, he says, I do not want to see anybody else for the rest of the day. And he sat down and read the whole novel through that day and said, we are publishing this novel. And it became one of the most instant successes in the history of English literature. And I turn it over to you, Barry. Now, I should point out that 10 years earlier, Charlotte Bronte had written the poet laureate of England, Robert Southey, to tell him that she had literary ambitions. She had sent some of the, the poems of herself and her sisters along 
And Sally, the poet laureate, wrote back the following letter. Literature cannot be the business of a woman's life, and it ought not to be. The more a woman is engaged in her proper duties, the less leisure will she have for it, even as an accomplishment and a recreation. To those duties you have not been called, and when you are, you will be less eager for celebrity. You will not seek an imagination for excitement, of which the vicissitudes of this life and the anxieties from which you must not hope to be exempted, be your state what it may, will bring with them but too much. Uh, Charlotte wrote back and thanked him for instructions by which she said she was certain she would profit. <laughs> now, it is important that we remember here that Charlotte Bronte awoke to find herself famous because she write, wrote a novel that was not like the kinds of novels people had been reading at the time. The hero and the heroine were nothing like what they had been used to. And even more astonishing, of course, the very idea that a woman, although she did not initially publish under a, a female name ever in her lifetime, actually, the idea that a woman could write a novel like this would have been absolutely impossible. And I would point out that the Brontes chose to write uh, under pseudonyms because they did not, as Charlotte said, we do not want to be judged as women authoresses. We want to be judged as people of genius. <laughs> now, and the names, though, the names were actually rather androgynous. Yes. So they, they at least did make that step. They were yes. very mysterious. That's great. Yes, because she said, well, we didn't want to tell lies. Uh, <laughs> so they chose these androgynous names. Now, please remember, in the 20th century, of course, we all think, well, of course, there were plenty of women writers, and we think immediately of Jane Austen, and we all go to the movies and think of Laurence Olivier and, you know, whoever. Here is Charlotte Bronte's comment on Jane Austen. She does her business of delineating the surface of the lives of genteel English people curiously well. What sees kindly, speaks aptly, moves flexibly, it suits her to study. But what throbs fast and full, though hidden, what the blood rushes through, what is the unseen seat of life and the sentient target of death, this Miss Austen ignores. She no more with her mind's eye beholds the heart of her race than each man with bodily vision sees the hearts in his, his, in his heaving breast. Jane Austen was a complete and most sensible lady but a very incomplete and rather insensible woman. If this is heresy, I cannot help it. <laughs> now, I read that because, of course, to us in the 20th century, it probably is heresy. And when she wrote that letter to George Henry Lewes, one of the great literary critics from the novel of the 19th century, he found it heresy because he told her that she should read Jane Austen in order to calm down her imagination. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, the Brontes did not go to the novels of women writers for their inspiration. Indeed, they didn't necessarily go to novels at all. They went to Shakespeare and Byron and the Romantic poets. And it's important that we remember that they not only would not have sounded like women writers when people began to pick up these novels, but the characters you meet there would not have come out of most novels at the period. Now, before I come back to Charlotte, I just want to say something about the way the 19th century man thought about what it meant to be born female. Uh, in the handouts, don't bother to look, but you can look when you go home. Uh, I have given you a passage from uh, two female conduct books of the period by Sarah Ellis. They sold as well in the 19th century as the joy of sex sells these days, uh, or at least used to before we knew everything. But at any rate, uh, let me tell you what Mrs. Ellis says about women. As women, the first thing of importance is to be content to be inferior to men, inferior in mental power in the same portion, proportion that you are inferior in bodily strength. Facility of movement, aptitude, and grace, the bodily frame of woman may possess in a higher degree than that of man. Just as in the softer touches of mental and spiritual beauty, her character may present a lovelier page than his. What then, I would ask, is love in its highest, holiest character? It is woman's all, her wealth, her power, her very being. Man let him love as he may, has ever an existence distinct from that of his affections. He has his worldly interest, his public character, 
his ambition, his competition with other men. But woman centers all in one feeling, love, and in that she lives, or else she has no life at all. And then, she says, the immediate object of the present work is to show how intimate is the connection which exists between the women of England and the moral character maintained by their country in the scale of nations. That is to say, as long as women never leave the house, they will be certain never to be polluted by ambition or the things that males like to do. Don't forget that the 19th century saw women as in some ways the most popular poem of the period was called The Angel in the House. And one of the things that made Jane Eyre scandalous was that Jane Eyre is so far from being the angel in the house. Now, I want to read you a comment from a literary critic at the time about the dangers of putting women as the chief protagonist of fiction. Listen to this. Uh, this is from a man named E.S. Dallas. Woman embodies our highest ideas of purity and refinement. And in thinking of the medieval times, we are often reminded that Adam was formed out of the dust of the earth, but Eve out of the living flesh. Adam was created no one knows where, but that Eve was born in the Garden of Eden. She was born in purity. And now, in the mid-19th century, when the influence of women is being poured into our literature, we expect to feel within it an evident ex excess of refinement. Alas, we find the very opposite. The first object of the novelist is to get personages in whom we can be interested. The next is to put them into action. But when in women are the chief characters, how are you to set them in motion? The life of women cannot well be described as a life of action. When women are thus put forward to lead the action of a plot, they must be urged into a false position. To get vigorous action, they are described as rushing into crime and doing masculine deeds. Thus, they come forward in the worst fight, and the novelist finds that to make an effect, he has to give up his heroine to bigamy, to murder, to illegitimacy and to all sorts of adventures which can only signify her fall. The very prominence of the position which women occupy in recent fiction leads by a natural process to their appearing in a light which is not good. This is called sensation. It is not wrong to make a sensation, but if the novelist depends for his sensation upon the action of a woman, the chances are that he will attain his end by unnatural means. It is certainly curious that one of the earliest results of an increased feminine influence in our literature should be a display of what, is in, of what in women is most unfeminine. One is reminded of the famous fact, and listen to this, of the famous fact that the first record of feminine conduct in the world's history is unfeminine. Eve is said to have eaten the apple in a masculine lust for power. She wanted to be as the gods. Adam ate the apple in a feminine weakness of affection for the mate who offered it. Woman peculiarly represents the private life of the race. Her ascendancy in literature must mean the ascendancy of domestic ideas and the assertion of the individual, not as a hero, but as a family man, not as a heroine, but as an angel in the house. The individual as a great public character withers. The individual as a member of society in all of his private relations grows in importance. Now, this is the kind of atmosphere into which Jane Eyre inserted itself and caused so much talk, scandal, outrage, and curiosity about who was the novelist. In the first place, Rochester is not like men in Victorian fiction. If you came here to see poor Pip in Great Expectations, he's, he's wonderful, but he is not a, a swashbuckling hero. If you've ever read Ivanhoe or all those Walter Scott novels, Ivanhoe, as you remember, spends most of the novel on a bed while, a good, while Rebecca looks out the women and tells him about the battles that are going on outside amongst the villains. In other words, men in, no in many novels of the period were domestic or domesticated. They weren't seen as the kind of Errol Flynn types, or indeed like our Rochester over here. Where did she get Rochester? 
she got him straight out of Lord Byron. Remember, Byron was called mad, bad, and dangerous to know. He had mistresses, amongst them probably one of his sisters, or who knows. Uh, he, his bleeding heart had been written about by himself and all the national inquirers of the day. Charlotte Bronte, in one of her letters, said, I do not think it's safe for a woman to read Lord Byron. It's bad for you, but I cannot put him down. <laughs> uh, so when she comes to write a novel, the first novel, she said, is plain and straightforward. Wasn't accepted. So she wrote Jane Eyre, and she knew what sold. If the public wants gothic matters, put a mad woman up in the attic and have a few screams, and you've got them. Secondly, if you want to have some vice, put a male in there who has a United Nations of mistresses <laughs> and will be happy to tell his pure governess about the women he has left behind him. Then, if you want a heroine, don't go to Jane Austen. I mean, we have all know what those women look like in Jane Austen. They are gorgeous, unless they're silly, but they're generally absolutely gorgeous. They look like the ladies in the movies. Jane Eyre was surprising to readers of the time because she didn't look quite like Elizabeth at all. She looked like she was a plain woman. And part of the novel's success, and part of the thing that it, of course, brought to English fiction was the fact that it put in front of the public a character who is not like any novel, any person anyone had been used, read, used to reading about in fiction. It put a, a male hero whom, no one, whom people were very familiar with in poetry and in Shakespeare, but again, not in domestic fiction. And I would remind you that novels in the 19th century in England were almost always domestic. Even the Scott novels, whether in medieval dress or in Scottish dress, are always centered around the home, finally. Uh, only, uh, you know, in France, it was different. In France, they wrote Madame Bovary while these women are writing uh, Jane Eyre, et cetera. And, you know, in Madame Bovary, they're having affairs on page 50. Uh, but in Jane Eyre, the point of being Jane Eyre was that Charlotte Bronte set out to qu question what she called the conventionalities of literature and the conventionalities of the way women were depicted in fiction. She did not believe in anything like, the, I mean, she said, women don't live like this, I will not write like this. And to present a plain heroine was, of course, to say to, to the public, a plain heroine can ask questions that beautiful women will not. And there are beautiful women in the novel. Blanche Ingram is quite beautiful, and of course, Rosalind Oliver. But it's important that all of us remember that when the public read this book, they found something amazingly coarse in the way that this woman talked. They weren't used to, and the reviewers time and again talked about no woman speaks like this. Now here is Jane Eyre as a young girl. Why was I always suffering, always browbeaten, always accused, forever condemned? Why could I never please? Why was it useless to win anyone's favor? Eliza, who was headstrong and selfish, was respected. Georgiana, who had a spoiled temper, was universally indulged. John, no one thwarted, much less punished. Though he twisted the necks of pigeons, killed the little pea chicks, set the dogs at the sheep, and stripped the hothouse vines of their fruit. He called his mother, old girl, bluntly disregarded her wishes, and he was still her own darling. I dared commit no fault. I strove to fulfill every duty, and I was termed naughty and tiresome, sullen and sneaking, from morning to noon and from noon to night. Unjust, unjust, said my reason. How all my brain was in tumult, and all my heart in insurrection, yet in what darkness, what dense ignorance was the mental battle fought. I could not answer the ceaseless inward question, why I thus suffered. Now, at the distance of, I will not say how many years, I see it clearly. And of course, what she does see clearly is that she suffers because she is not docile, not pretty, and not what the novel in the very first, in the third paragraph calls natural. Uh, Mrs. Reed tells her that when she is a natural, docile, frank, light-hearted child who doesn't ask questions, she will be able to sit near the fire and join the family. And one of the things that marks Jane Eyre throughout this novel is the ceaseless inward questions 
that she continues to ask. This is the first, the great passage and the most revolutionary passage of the novel. I longed for a power of vision which might overpass that limit, which might reach the busy world, towns, regions full of life I had heard of but never seen. I believed in the existence of other and more vivid kinds of goodness. And what I believed in, I wished to behold. Who blames me? Many, no doubt. And I shall be called discontented. I could not help it. The restlessness was in my nature. It agitated me to pain sometimes. It is in vain to say human beings ought to be satisfied with tranquility. They must have action, and they will make it. They cannot find it. Millions are condemned to a stiller doom than mine, and millions are silent in silent revolt against their lot. Women are supposed to be very calm, generally. But women feel just as men feel. They need exercise for their faculties and a field for their efforts as much as their brothers do. They suffer from too rigid a restraint, too absolute a stagnation, precisely as men would suffer. And it is never minded in their more privileged fellow creatures to say that they ought to confine themselves to making puddings and knitting stockings, to playing on the piano and embroidering bags. It is thoughtless to condemn them or laugh at them if they seek to do more or learn more than custom has pronounced necessary for their sex. And the revolutionary thing about this passage, and I would remind you that she, said, she uses the word revolt here Remember that Jane Eyre came out in the hungry 40s in England when you had riots in the streets, when you had constant workers' problems, and when in 1848, don't forget, there was another French Revolution. Now, one of the things that you can hear here is the passage that was the most shocking of all is to say that women feel as men feel. In the 19th century, it was assumed that men had highly, were highly sexually charged, etc., but that women had no interest in sexuality, that women, the women's feelings were all domestic. And to proclaim that women feel as men feel is in that period to throw down the gauntlet. Uh, Queen Victoria, who's wonderful in her letters, and I highly recommend them, wrote that uh, as a monarch, she knew that she had to be interested in political matters, but she knew that as a wife, politics made her less gentle. And she tried to keep away from thinking about politics when her Albert was, was around. Now, Charlotte Bronte thought that hokum. She did not have any interest in being told that women did not have highly passionate natures. And if you'll remember, one of the great things about Jane Eyre in, that accompanies this passage is that every time she says things like this in the novel, and I might add in the dramatization, she hears this enormous laugh. <laughs> I mean, whenever she says, I want a world out there, I want to go beyond where I have been, to, beyond the space to which I have been confined, there's a, mad, there's a laugh always accompanies the expression of a woman's desire. And one of the things that, I mean, the mad woman in the attic is the silliest claptrappy device you could imagine. But of course, it's perfect theatrical claptrap that accompanies, that, that in some ways suggests the opposite of the confinement of Jane Eyre. It keeps warning her that to experience desire on your own is always dangerous. But it also keeps alerting the reader that her desires are real and not something that can simply be ignored because she is female. And I should point out that when the reviewers got hold of the book, not to mention the reading public, and remember it was an enormous bestseller, they all talked about the language of passion and often the lack of femininity in this novel. This uh, let's hear some comments from the reviewers. <laughs> Sorry. This indeed is a book after our own heart. The writer is evidently a woman, and unless we are deceived, new in the world of literature, but man or woman, young or old, be that as it may, no such book has gladdened our eyes for a long time. It is a very prophetic tale. It's very singular. And so much like truth that it is difficult to avoid believing that much of the characters and incidents are taken from life. In spite of all novel rules, the love heroine of the tale has no personal beauty to recommend her to the deepest affection of the man of sense. 
vegetation, and who had seen much of the world, not uncontaminated by it. It seems to have been the purpose of the author to show that high and noble sentiments and great affection can be both made subservient and even heightened by the energy of a practical wisdom. The execution of the painting is as perfect as the conception. The hero and heroine are beings both so singularly unattractive that the reader feels they can have no vocation in the novel but to be brought together. <laughs> it is a very remarkable book. We have no remembrance of another combining such genuine power with such horrid taste. It is true Jane does write and exerts great moral strength, but it is the strength of a mere heathen mind, which is a law unto itself. No Christian grace is perceptible upon her. She has inherited in fullest measure the worst sin of our fallen nature, the sin of pride. Altogether, the autobiography of Jane Eyre is preeminently an anti-Christian composition. Still, we say again, this is a very remarkable book. It is impossible not to be spellbound with the freedom of the touch. If we ascribe the book to a woman at all, we have no alternative but to ascribe it to one who has, for some sufficient reason, long forfeited the society of her home sex. In the same article, there were complaints about the reality of Blanche Ingram, the character I play in Jane Eyre. Above all, no woman attires another in such fancy dresses as Jane's ladies assume. Miss Ingram coming down, irresistible, in a morning robe of sky-blue crepe. A girl's, a gauze azure scarf twisted in her hair. No lady, we understand, when suddenly roused in the night, would think of putting on a frock. <laughs> Virginia Woolf would say in 1925, at the end, we are steeped through and through with the genius, the vehemence, the indignation of Charlotte Bronte. The drawbacks of being Jane Eyre are not far to seek. Always to be a governess and always to be in love is a serious limitation in a world which is full, after all, of people who are neither one nor the other. We read Charlotte Bronte not for exquisite observation of character. Her characters are vigorous and elementary. Not for comedy. Hers is grim and crude. Not for a philosophic view of life. Hers is that of a country parson's daughter, but for her poetry. And of course, it is that poetry that has kept people reading and talking about Jane Eyre. I said early on in these remarks that Jane Eyre uh, didn't sound like other novels. Uh, it is a highly symbolic novel. It, that is to say, it is filled with fire and air and cold and wet and damp. And you know that the fiery characters are Jane and Rochester, and you know that the cold and damp characters are the good parson uh, or the bad men whom she doesn't like. Uh, the novel works on a constant sense. I mean, uh, St. John Rivers walks into the room and says something about, I'm cold, and throws his uh, coat off and the snow on it. And Jane Eyre says, well, fire melts ice. Uh, uh, the great scene that's in, this, uh, that's in this dramatization from the novel of when Rochester's bed catches on fire. I mean, this happens as Jane is lying down the hall and she's thinking of him. And only in a novel like this, as the woman thinks of the man in his bed catch on fire, <laughs> then, of course, she does what no good woman in the 19th century would do. She rushes into his bedroom and throws a bucket of water on the bed, and he thinks, is it the flood? Come again. That is, and then he tells her to please not look until he puts some clothes on. The point being is that everything about the novel is unconventional. But the poetic way the novel works if you remember the first chapter, the first page, Jane is not near the fire. At Lowood, she is not near the fire. She wants so badly to be a part of a family structure. And one of the things that marks the change in the movement of the novel, after the great business of the mad woman and you know the fires and all of that, Jane Eyre leaves Rochester's house, and they do that brilliantly on the stage here, and she goes out totally abandoned, no money, nothing, and she sees in the distance a window. Now, throughout the novel, she's looked out windows and wanted to see a world elsewhere, wanted to have an experience of a world outside. But at this moment, she sees in the distance a window, 
and she looks into the window and sees two young women sitting by the fire. And of course, as only in a Victorian novel, they turn out to be her long lost relatives. <laughs> <laughs> but don't forget, for Victorians, you know, we think if you're, you know, if you, you never, if we think coincidence is crazy and stupid, Victorians saw coincidence as a sign that there is a God that determines our ends. But in this novel, and Jane Eyre was thought often not a very godly novel, in the, and particularly after all, she turns down a minister, a gorgeous one in fact, to marry him and chooses Rochester. But the point is, when she sees the window and the fire, and then she comes into the house, the whole movement of the book is, after all, being about a woman who has wanted to choose the world she lives in. And she realizes, and it's both one of the great moments of the novel, in some ways a, a sad moment, that the great warming world for her is the fireplace. But it, in that moment, it's not associated with men. It's associated with those two women. And, and then, of course, she gets a legacy. But again, she starts gussying up the house. And the minister says, oh, you're born, you're born for labor, not for love. She says, oh, I happen to like cleaning a house. And when she finally comes back to Rochester at the end, one of the first things she does is light the fire. That is to say, of course, it's a domestic scene, but one has to remember that in, when she says, we were married and he was bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, you know what that means. Secondly, the great phrase in the book, reader, I married him. Jane Eyre is the subject of her life. She is not Mrs. Rochester. And please remember that the book is called Jane Eyre. It's, it's her name and her life. She is not known in relationship to a man, and she is not known as a novelist, but as an autobiographer. And the homecoming of the end of the novel is on her terms. Choosing to say no to a minister is something a good, parson, a good daughter would never have done in the 19th century. And indeed, we'll hear more about that. But Jane Eyre, with its rich symbolism of the heat, of fire that can consume you, but heat that can warm you and allow you an expansive life, even domestically, constantly reminds the reader of what this novel has been about. And that is to say, that a woman can write, can tell, can choose her own story. Reader, I married him. <laughs> <laughs>
I hope you have not been involving yourself in any silly expense. I think I may gain some money by it. May I read you some reviews? So she read them. Then she asked if he would read the book. You may leave it. I'll see. The next day at tea, Mr. Bronte made this announcement. Children, Charlotte has been writing a book. And I think it is a better one than I expected. Emily and Anne never dare tell him about their most scandalous books. Now can you imagine? They all lived in this tiny little parsonage and he never knew. He never knew what was going on. It's really quite remarkable, and Emily and Anne never did reveal that they were the authors of their books, and he found out much, much later. So we come to an incredible uh, moment here with the publication of Wuthering Heights. And uh, it really, Emily's novel couldn't have been, in many ways, more different from Charlotte's. I mean, one of the things that it's important to remember that Wuthering Heights does not have Lord Olivier uh, or Merle Oberon. It is a fiend of a novel. Indeed, da Dante Gabriel Rossetti, a uh, pre-Raphaelite poet, said Wuthering Heights is a fiend of a book, an incredible monster. The action is laid in hell, only it seems places and people have English names there. <laughs> now, what it reminds you of is that Wuthering Heights doesn't look like, at least in the part that we all know so well, it doesn't look like any other novel of the 19th century. If you'll remember, it has two stories, the great Catherine Heathcliff story and the second story, which is the story of, of the second Kathy, Catherine's daughter, and the man from the original family whom she finally marries and thus cre recreates the family estates. The now, one, but if you only know the movie, Yes. So the, the Aunt Lawrence Olivier movie, that never happens. Then they tell the first part of the story. And it's actually the whole arc of the story which makes this the great novel that it is. And one of the things I want you to take away from this, we're going to have some readings from it in a moment, but one of the things you should remember is that Emily Bronte tells the same story twice. <coughs> the second time she writes a Victorian novel and leaves out its originality. Let's have some readings. This is Kathy and Heathcliff, the two very unusual hero and heroine. Kathy uh, says, This is nothing. I was only going to say that heaven did not seem to be my home. And I broke my heart with weeping to come back to earth. And the angels were so angry that they flung me out into the middle of the heath on the top of Wuthering Heights, where I woke sobbing for joy. That will do to explain my secret as well as the other. I've no more business to marry Edgar Linton as I have to be in heaven. And if that wicked man in there had not brought Heathcliff so low, I shouldn't have thought of it. It would degrade me to marry Heathcliff now. So he shall never know how I love him. And that not because he's handsome, Nellie, but because he's more myself than I am. Whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. And Linton's is as different as a moonbeam from lightning or frost from fire. Oh, Kathy. Oh, my life. How can I bear it? What now? You and Edgar have broken my heart, Heathcliff. And now you both come to bewail the deed to me as if you were the people to be pitied. I shall not pity you. Not I. You have killed me and thriven on it, I think. How strong you are. How many years do you mean to live after I am gone? I wish I could hold you till we were both dead. I shouldn't care what you suffered. I care nothing for your sufferings. Why shouldn't you suffer? I, I do. Will you forget me? Will you be happy when I am in the earth? Will you say 20 years hence, that's the grave of Catherine Earnshaw. I loved her long ago and was wretched to lose her, but it is past. Will you say so, Heathcliff? Don't torture me until I'm as mad as yourself. Are you possessed with the devil to talk in that manner to me when you are dying? 
do you reflect that all those words would be branded in my memory and eating deep for eternally after you have left me? You know you lie to say that I have killed you. And Catherine, you know that I could as soon forget you as my own existence. Is it not sufficient for your infernal selfishness that while you are at peace, I shall ride in the torments of hell? I shall not be in peace. I'm not wishing you greater torment than I have, Heathcliff. I only wish us never to be parted. And should a word of mine distress you hereafter, think, I feel the same distress underground. And for my own sake, forgive me. Come here. Kneel down again. You never harmed me in your life. Nay, if you nurse anger, that will be worse to remember then by my harsh words. Won't you come here again? Do! Oh, do come to me, Heathcliff. Betray your own heart, Kathy. You loved me. And what right have you to leave me? What right? Answer me! For the poor fancy you felt for Linton. Because misery and degradation and death and nothing that Satan and God could inflict could ever part us. You, of your own will, did it. I have not broken your heart. You have broken it. And breaking it, you break mine. So much the worse for me that I am strong. Do I want to live? What kind of living will it be when you... Oh, God. Would you like to live with your soul in a grave? Let me alone. Let me alone. <laughs> if I have done wrong, I'm dying for it. It is enough. You left me too. But I won't upbraid you. I forgive you. Forgive me. It is hard to forgive. And to look at those eyes. And to feel those wasted hands. Kiss me again. But do not let me see your eyes. I forgive what you have done to me. I love my murderer, but yours? How can I? So this is what the critics would say about that novel. Repulsive vulgarity. Such a disagreeable story when England needs sunshine more than ever. <laughs> An attempt to corrupt the virtue of the sturdy descendants of the Puritans. This is a strange book. Wild, confused, disjointed, and improbable. And the people who make up the drama are savages, ruder than those who lived in the days of Homer. Nightmares and dreams through which devils dance and wolves howl make bad novels. Later, the Palladium would counter. We look upon Wuthering Heights as the flight of an impatient fancy fluttering in the very exultation of young wings. There are passages in this book of which any novelist, past or present, might be proud. We cannot praise too warmly the brave simplicity, the unaffected air of intense belief, the admirable combination of extreme likelihood with the rarest of originality, the exquisite but unconscious art with which the chiaroscuro of the whole is managed. And of course, what we've heard here is extravagant passion, but when you read the novel, it is also clear that this passion is destructive of everything around it. 
Uh, the, other hero, the other male in the novel, whom Catherine does marry, well, right before she has these great deathbed scenes, uh, is Edgar Linton. We are all legends because we like theater and plays. But Edgar Linton himself is totally mystified by this woman whom he marries and whom, however, he says, I know that she makes life possible. He too dies out of the marriage. The point being is that for Victorians, a, a, a couple so vastly selfish were so far from the domestic idea. These were figures, again, out of Byron, out of Shakespeare, out of Antony and Cleopatra. These were figures for whom all the domestic sanctities, not to mention, and get, again, remember the dating of the novel, not to mention all the social responsibilities that the word duty placed as incumbent on men and women simply seemed absent. On the other hand, with the death of Catherine, Heathcliff then becomes a wretched villain of the novel. One other note, when Catherine is a child and her brother is a child, they ask their father, who is going to Liverpool, to bring them a gift. The little boy asks for a violin. The girl asks for a whip. The father <laughs> brings back Heathcliff. In other words, Shaw Emily Bronte from the beginning has been upsetting all the stereotypes as her sister did. But unlike Jane Eyre, the heroine, the first heroine in, in Wuthering Heights says, I am Heathcliff. There is that sense that you cannot exist in heaven, uh, that you cannot exist in a house. She says, we're never so happy as when we're dashing across the moors. The second, uh, those bleak moors that we heard about earlier. The second half of the novel, you have a blonde head heroine, a poor abused child, and by the end, they are married and living happily ever after. That is to say, the second half of the novel becomes a great Victorian novel celebrating the way a woman can bring a man back into civilization. Uh, at the same time, everybody knew, and this is of course being before Charlotte Bronte came back in this century, Wuthering Heights became one of the great poems of the 19th century and the early 20th. And I think it's appropriate tonight that the last word on Wuthering Heights be said by the mystified Charlotte Bronte about her sister's novel. Whether it is right or advisable to recreate beings like Heathcliff, I do not know. I scarcely think it is. But this I know. The writer who possesses the creative gift owns something of which he is not always the master. Something that at times, strangely, wills and works for itself. If the result be attractive, the world will praise you. Who little deserve praise. <coughs> if it be repulsive, the same world will blame you. Who almost as little deserve blame. Wuthering Heights was hewn in a wild workshop with simple tools out of homely materials. The statuary found a granite block on a solitary moor. With time and labor, the crag took human shape. And there it stands, colossal, dark, and frowning, half statue, half rock, the former sense, terrible and goblin-like, in the latter, almost beautiful, for its coloring is of mellow gray, and moorland moss clothes it, and heath, with its blooming bells and balmy fragrance, grows faithfully close the giant's foot. So now our story of Charlotte Bronte is going to draw rapidly to a close. At this time, Branwell dies, as we heard, of his dissipated life. At his funeral, Emily catches pneumonia. This brings on her tubercular condition, and in a very few months after that, she is dead. They find in her desk five terrible reviews of Wuthering Heights comparing it unfavorably to Jane Eyre. She actually would not really ever see her novel of fame in her lifetime, and when she was dying, she would ask repeatedly to see every review that was written, and they were all horrible. The, the good words on, on Wuthering Heights would come out just a little bit later, and she never knew at all of the success of her novel. And meanwhile, her brother never knew that the sisters had ever written anything. He never knew. 
Then, at Emily's funeral, Anne catches a cold. She con contracts this tubercular condition as well, and in, within a few more months, she dies. All three brothers, the brother and the two sisters, die within the one year. Now, Charlotte and her father are the only ones left. And Charlotte has been the, the rock through all of this. She writes this letter to her friend. A year ago, had a prophet warned me how I should stand in June 1849, how stripped and bereaved. Had he foretold the autumn, the winter, the spring of sickness and suffering to be gone through, I should have thought this can never be endured. It is over. Branwell, Emily, Anne gone like dreams, gone as Mariah and Elizabeth went twenty years ago. One by one I have watched them fall asleep on my arm and close their glazed eyes. I have seen them buried one by one, and thus far God has upheld me. From my heart I thank him. But the two human beings who understood me and whom I understood are gone. So Charlotte literally would be at every one of her siblings' death. She would be with them till the moment they died. She witnessed all of it. Now she's alone with her father. And the amazing irony of life, literature, anything you can imagine happens to Charlotte Bronte. She can't write for a little while, but after that she gets her inspiration back and she writes a novel, Shirley which is um, fairly successful. And at this time, her sister's novels are published in America. Remember, this is a different publisher. <coughs> he puts out in America that they're actually written by the famous Currer Bell. When she finds this out, she's indignant because of her sister's memory. The two sisters who in Jane Eyre are the Rivers sisters are models of the beloved sisters that she had. Um, she goes to London and reveals her identity. She goes to the terrible bad wolf publisher that did this and sets them straight, and she comes out as to who she is. And everybody's amazed that this passionate, fiery, angry thing that they all imagined is this tiny little woman who's very proper, very, very uh, intelligent when she speaks, and very, very opinionated, but, but in very proper fashion. And actually, this is when a whole transformation happens as people become to realize who Charlotte Bronte really was. Soon after that, she will publish The Let as well, which is about her experience in, with the professor back in Brussels and uh, that uh, affair that went on there. That's what the novel becomes about. And it's quite a different novel from anything she ever wrote and quite fascinating if any of you choose to read it. Uh, you should read it. It's probably one of the most terrifying pictures of a woman alone will ever read in any fiction. Now we come to the end, and we have a new character that you would never believe if it happened in a novel, you would say that Ugh. these happy endings don't happen, but Mr. Nichols comes along. Mr. Nichols was another curate, the third one in her life, and he um, takes a fancy to Charlotte. And again, it comes totally out of the blue, and she reports what happens again to her friend in one of her letters. Thank God she wrote all these letters, and her friend <laughs> kept them. Keep those letters. <laughs> now we have email, you can't keep letters anymore. I then heard Mr. Nichols open the parlor door as if going. I expected the clash of the front door. He stopped in the passage. He tapped. Like lightning, it flashed on me what was coming. He entered. He stood before me. What his words were, you can guess. His manner, you can hardly realize. Never can I forget it. Shaking from head to foot, looking deadly pale, speaking low, yet with difficulty. He made me, for the first time, feel what it costs a man to declare his affection where he doubts respond. 
She told him no. He, and he was the first person to want to marry her because he loved her, he admired her, not because he wanted her to teach the pupils. She, however, went to her father and reported to him uh, what had happened. Her father was furious. He was outraged. This, this Mr. Nichols was the assistant to uh, Bronte at the, at the church. Uh, it was a huge scandal, and Mr. Nichols had to leave the town. He eventually moved out. However, he did not give up. He kept very insistently, but in a very um, forthright and upright manner, writing her. He was able to establish a correspondence with her, and he kept periodically still bringing up the subject. Charlotte became very admiring of his fortitude, and she began to find it quite interesting, especially in the light of the fact that her father hated it so much. So slowly but surely, they wear down the stone, and she, her stone first, and she starts to take an interest, and you have to imagine her up in that lonely parsonage with her horrible father and all of her brothers and sisters buried around her and all this stuff. She, I think, saw this finally as an outlet, and she decided that she would um, say yes. However, she had to get her father's permission first. First of all, she had to ask her father permission. A 36-year-old woman had to ask her father permission to even write him a letter. So this is not that mad, fiery, passionate Charlotte that we know that writes novels. The woman in real life is really quite confined. It took two years before finally, uh, because then also you had to have your father's approval to marry. Without it, you know, that was the worst thing that could possibly happen. You couldn't really do it. You couldn't officially marry. So finally he said that he did not uh, withdraw, he just withdrew, withdrew his objection, but he didn't really give his acceptance, but he withdrew his objection. So she was able to marry him. At the last minute, the father does not come to give her away. And her dear friend back to that school, that Miss Temple character, that teacher friend of hers from long ago comes to the wedding, and she uh, gives her away at the ceremony. She marries Mr. Nichols. They go off to, uh, on a honeymoon trip and visit his family. She doesn't love him when she starts this marriage. But she discovers during the course of the marriage a great affection for him. And of course, when she comes back from her honeymoon, there's quite a little bit of passion going on here that she never expected to come to her in her life. But more than just discovering her own sexuality and her passion in this marriage, she discovered what it meant for her. She'd written this for her heroines, but what it meant for her to be loved. This man took care of her in every way. When they went to see something, they discussed it and looked at it together. He was totally interested in her, her work, her writing. He commented on whether she had a partner in life. When she returned to the parsonage, she was pregnant. She, her husband, and Mr. Bronte were now living in the parsonage. She would never abandon her father, and she made that perfectly clear to him. That was maybe one of the reasons why he was resistant to the marriage, but she would never abandon her father. At the same time that she became pregnant and she returned, she also developed consumption. She was dying. Her husband gave her the most incredible care through her illness, and two months before the baby was to be born, she died. The irony of all time is that the father and the husband who hated each other spent the rest of their days living together in that parsonage. And Mr. Nichols would be the guardian of the work of the Brontes and would see to further publication of other works that had not been published and uh, really uh, respected and revered his wife and his sister's-in-law's achievement. It's quite a fascinating story. And that actually brings us to the end of the tale because there's nowhere else to go. That is the story of the Bronte.